Okay, so I can let me just introduce the speaker. So for the last um, talk of the Trigonal Quantum Fundamental Seminar, we have Simon Vettel. I hope that's pronounced correctly. Um, who will be giving a talk on wavelets and quantum field theory. Um, take it away. Simon. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. I know it's it's been. Um, I think Nico was trying to invite me like three times and I didn't have time with me. Okay, that should be working now. Okay, um, right. So I've heard there was some interest about hearing um, uh, about the work that we do in Sydney with uh, Gavin, Brennan, and Dan, George um, on wavelets. So I particularly, I didn't know which topic to focus on in particular. So I've decided to do it kind of a idea buffet. Um, so basically, I'm going to go through like the topics that we've been looking at recently in sort of chronological order. Um, and then if you, yeah, if you find any of those uh, things interesting, then uh, I guess we could, we could chat about them in more detail. So um i'm going to start with uh with the discrete wavelet transform and this um sort of technology uh first developed in like 80s where they were looking at um seismic signals and I guess uh, the conventional Fourier analysis wasn't as good for those purposes. Um, and that's where they developed this, this wavelet analysis. And well, on, the, on the right, you can kind of see the uh, representation of that in in 2d on an on an image um right because then later on they've implemented like the the jp uh, jpeg 2000 standard for image compression uses wavelets the, the wavelet transform and so the way it works is kind of it it picks, um, it sort of selects features of different scale. So the, the big in a, the big image in the top right, right uh, of the of the figure, uh, is I think the coarsest scale, like the the largest scale features of the image. So you can kind of see the outline of the tower and like the windows and the you know the the palace kind of outline and then in the in, in those in those other images you can kind of see that they they capture the finer details of the of the of the overall image so so the way to think about well, one way to think about it is to think of it as a way to organize um, like details or features according to their scale, right? Um, and I, I, oh yeah, and I wanted to mention like uh, one of the biggest names in wavelet analysis, which is Ingrid Ingrid Dabouche. And she developed a lot of a lot of maths for wavelets, 
and then a lot of interesting applications like i think i think she even managed to find out how to use wavelets for art restoration um yeah a lot, a lot of interesting applications um so so what what is like wavelet transform like mathematically so we start with what they sometimes call this like multi-resolution analysis or multi-scale approximation and it's kind of introduced in this enigmatic way of like this sequence like infinite sequence of nested subspaces of of your square integrable functions right and this like the the, the v0 is sometimes referred to as the as the model subspace and why is it the model well it's the one that is spanned by this scaling function um and it's integer shifts so you like pick some kind of waveform and then you uh shift it around the the real axis and then you take all possible linear combinations of those and that gives you the uh v0 and for this kind of um sequence to work in this way um we require that like the scaling function satisfies this sort of renormalization equation it's like saying that um how do you say it? it's like the scaling function can be written in terms of itself at a finer scale um so all of this wavelet stuff is kind of becoming fractal in a sense and they sometimes call it like fractal analysis i think i've seen it um anyway so you you so your wavelet where your scaling function can be any arbitrary function so it's it has to be sort of self-similar in this in this way um and then once you, you find those coefficients you can then use them to define uh another function which is called the wavelet the actual wavelet and this definition basically guarantees that the wavelet function and the scaling function are um, going to be orthogonal to each other right um so oh yeah and i i think i've forgotten to mention that the uh that the scaling function should be orthogonal to like its integer shifts i think that's also a uh, requirement um so then with these two you can kind of you can you can pick a scale right and then once you fix this scale you can produce an orthonormal basis of of your square integrable functions and the scaling function kind of provides you with uh with the degrees of freedom at that uh coarsest scale r and then those uh wavelet functions kind of provide you with uh, with uh, a refinement i right? just like with finer finer details uh, in your uh, signal and right oh yeah and then so that's um, maybe that's I can not actually up. the way yes 
Yes. Ah, okay, yeah, Magdalena. Just to be sure, so I um, think I, I'm not sure if I understood where from this kind of interpretation in terms of refining scale comes from, because uh, what I understood is uh, that for every R, you had uh, this set of functions and they all form a basis. I mean, it's written. So this means mm -hmm. I can write any function in terms of those. So where is the refinement coming in? Uh, I think I missed some key steps. Ah, so that's that's kind of uh, that comes in with the um, with the uh, example of that image, right? So if we were to use, I think only the scaling function, like the scale functions. Um, we would get that rough outline like of in that in that image um but um so yes like it is a basis but if you only keep like a a, a few like if you discard the uh the wavelet uh part of the basis right you decompose your function and then you throw away the wavelets function coefficients and you only keep your scale that that gives you a rough um let's say outline in the image and then and then if you if you add in those um those um coefficients with with the wavelet functions then you um then you that's 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 what i mean by refinement then you're adding in um further detail um cool. yeah uh, yeah that, that makes that's, it clear thank you. yeah okay. yeah yeah thanks um so what is actually the wavelet transform so um you can establish that uh for a for a given scale you have an isomorphism like like your uh subspace at scale r uh, can be written as a direct sum of two orthogonal subspaces one at at a finer scale uh, right the v is spanned by the by the scaling function and the w by the wavelet function uh, at that scale um, and then the wavelet transform can kind of be understood as um, as a as a basis transformation right you like you have your expansion uh of, of the function that lives uh, lives in the vr subspace and the wavelet transform is like rewriting it in terms of um the finer scale basis and you can imagine that you can that you repeat this process right on that vr minus one subspace and that in general gives you an n level discrete wavelet transform this scale so um yeah you you have kind of your rough details and then kind of the um, finer details, right? Um, I think that's the maths, yeah. So what do we actually, so how, how do we use it in, in our field theory? So um, this is an example of like a scalar field. Um, and since um, it, we have an orthonormal basis, we could, for example, um, expand our field operators in terms of that basis. Um, so these are like the you know, 
Fourier coefficients in in the wavelet basis. Um, so essentially, by doing that, you so of course you could do it with any other basis. Um, but the nice thing about the wavelet basis is that you still you still have a notion of a position, right? Because each um, each wavelet function has a uh, has a index for position, right? Which means like how much is it off offset from the zero? Um, and additionally, you have you have a scale label, so. So the way you could imagine it, right? This is kind of like an. Uh, it's either if you do it for field theory on on a circle, or if you decide to, like you know, compactify your real line into a circle. So it's kind of a cartoon of how you can view it. So like these green dots in the in the middle, like represent the um the coarsest scale like the the, the roughest features uh, or the, like i guess you could probably call them like long wavelength even though the concept of wavelength and scale uh aren't the same thing um but sort of, you know, in a sense, they are the, like the longest wavelength. Um, and then you can, so at each scale, you kind of have this circle layer of, of those modes. And then when you move radially, like that's when you go to um, finer scales and you can kind of see that um, the, the points get denser and denser as you um, uh, as you increase the scale. Um, so yeah, so we so that's one nice thing. You can start with your continuous um, uh, theory and then end up with a lattice theory um, with. Uh, with still well-defined notion of position. Um, I guess you can do the same if you impose a band limit on the field, right? So I think Dominic has uh, done some working out on that correspondence um, between like the band limitation and, and this uh, wavelet composition. I believe that the conclusion was that you can kind of view each scale as its own band limited section, I guess. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's what I remember. Um, and even in here, like there are some interesting observations. Um, so this is uh, this is mostly not my work. This is what Dan did um, before I joined the group. Um, so basically, that that paper came out like just a few months before I joined. Um, so I'm going to kind of give a few of the upshots that they uh, found out. Uh, Using using this wavelet de description, so here you can kind of see that um, that if you if you use your wavelet description on a massive theory, um, you can see that it kind of is able to capture uh, renormalization in a sense, like that, that the scale or 
to phrase it in a better way, that the scale kind of aligns with what we would call the renormalization scale or the renormalization variable in, like, you know, uh, for example, for renormalization group equations. And there are some people trying to do that. Um, um, so this is kind of an indication. So if you have a massive theory, you kind of expect um, the correlations to fall off exponentially and that and that correlation length is um, related to the to the mass of the of the theory. And so here we have a we started with a bosonic theory with a bare mass of m zero. And then here we have plots like these are um, uh, the the y axis is logarithmic, so that we can see exponentials as linear functions. So um, yeah, so these. Uh, the large number means a finer scale. So this finer scale corresponds to like the, it's very much close to the bare mass. Um, so it kind of follows that, that exponential um, fall off of those correlations. And then as we kind of make our uh, look at the coarser uh, description, like we kind of we are kind of throwing away or what's the best word? It's kind of similar to that um, if you've I forgot the name, but when you do the uh, renormalization for a lattice of spins like you can zoom out and then group a uh, few spins into a single spin with an average um, spin so here when we're moving uh, when we're changing that um, scale parameter we're also kind of doing this zoom out and you, you can see it in the um, in the way that the that the mass is changing with the scale. Um, the other cool thing is that they they were looking at so so you know in the early two thousands people used wavelets for image compression. So the idea was, well, can we do uh, some sort of thing for state compression? And by state compression, we mean like we have a state um, and we decompose it um, into the into the wavelet basis, and then we discard some of the coefficients in that expansion. Right, like for example, the the coefficients corresponding to um, the the wavelet functions, right? So, and that that would kind of be the idea behind that that state compression. And the question was, if we do this sort of compression, can we still notice um, some effects. So this is kind of a proof of concept on detecting phase transitions. So here you have, um, so first of all, you have some kind of Hamiltonian that's that has some parameter. In our case, it's it's the mass, 
and we're trying to detect the phase where you know the the, the theory is um, massless and you have you do a fidelity overlap of two ground states right which are at two sides of some central value um and you know then the outcome is that uh in general you you can't you know discard whatever you want but you know there are some compression levels right so meaning how many how much how much information you discard that you still can kind of detect um the the, the phase transition okay or the other thing um for state compression is like evaluating mutual information and you know that whenever you start working with these entropic quantities in, in this many body systems um it can get kind of hairy and out of hand real quick um so this kind of idea is well instead of using like the full description uh of all the all the modes can we approximate the mutual information just by a few a few rough scale modes of the two subsystems so here like you have a subsystem a and subsystem b and then you have this kind of bulk um, description of those subsystems right so these are like the the rougher scales um and the idea is can we approximate the mutual information between those two regions by just a few um wave of modes uh, in this in this scale bulk um and the answer is yeah um here like so here the compression level kind of corresponds to uh the rectangles in the in the figure and specifically how um well basically like the higher the compression the less modes we are using would be the yeah the, the way to explain that so it's kind of like making higher compression compression level the, the smaller this um, rectangle is um so yeah um so that's that's kind of the the work that you know Gavin and Dan were doing uh, before I came in and then we wanted to go a step further so the same way you have like discrete Fourier transform and continuous Fourier transform um you can also have a continuous wave of transform right where um instead of those translations and scalings being uh, discrete those could be now continuous variables and um there are some you know of course trade-offs um one of them is that well we're 
are no longer working um, with with a basis because while well, we have we have too many functions, um, we have a we have a set of functions that that's parameterized by continuous variables. Um, so instead, we have a frame, but that's, that's still all right. Like you know, Fourier transform is a frame, kind of, um, and you can. So when you when you do this continuous wave of transform, you you have this sort of cool description. Um, so, for example, like imagine this is like synthetic data, right? So, imagine you have some sort of signal at some frequency for some period of time, and then the frequency changes, and then Again, the frequency changes. And when you do the continuous wave of transform of this, um, of this uh, signal, you kind of get like a, I, I like to call it like a musical representation of, of the signal <laughs> because it kind of resembles like a, like a, a music sheet, right? Like you, you, you can clearly see that, uh, we have some tone for for this period of time, and then some other tone for this period of time, and then a different one. And like even even if you make you know your signal noisy, you can you can still kind of make out those bands. Um, and if you if you were to do some I guess filtering. I think you could you could really see those uh, see those bands even in that in that noisy picture. So right, so these like wavelet coefficients or scale dependent functions they are still computed in kind of the same way. Um, uh, just that the translation and scale are now continuous. Um, right, there is also like some of you may know that the, the Fourier transform is intimately related to the to the group of translations. Um, and the wavelet transform is also related to a group, um, specifically the affine group in in one D, right? Because like if you look what we're what we're kind of um, taking the overlap with, it's it's a it's a unitary uh, representation of the of the affine group. On, on our square integrable functions. And well, it kind of gives you a recipe how to how to generalize um, the way would transform into higher dimensions. Um, oh, that's not here. Right. Yeah, so like Similar to the Fourier transform, like when where we map functions to this base of functions on on the group of translation, like the, the wave of transform maps functions on space to functions on the group of or on the affine group, right? Um, so the also like nice analogy, like the the way you can also think about the wavelet transform is like um, is lying somewhere between like the uh, time domain and the frequency domain of the signal, right? Because like if you if you look at that transformation of that of that uh, like that signal where the frequency changes over time. 
um, you can see that we have both like frequency and temporal um, resolution. Right. The problem is like you you cannot cheat the uncertainty relations, right? You can like so so above you have a perfect resolution in time, but you have no idea about frequency. Uh, whereas if you were to do the Fourier transform, you would have like three peaks at those particular frequencies. So you would have very good resolution in frequency, but you you would have zero information about how those frequencies are distributed through time. And the wave of transform kind of trades off the resolution in both to give you that information like, hey, like in this time interval, you have some sort of frequency you don't know which one you have a sort of band that it could be in but then you know that in some other time interval the the band changes right so we have a different frequency um and so on so the question kind of arises can you so so that's we've we've done it one way the question is, can you can you go back? Can you take your wavelet representation of the function and then recover the original? And the answer is yes, but your wavelet function has to satisfy some conditions. Um, it's mainly this condition. Um, I think I have forgotten. I, I think I used to have a nice uh, interpretation for that for that condition, but I, I think I've forgotten it. Um, you, you can you know, treat it as like a mathematical statement that if this holds, then uh, the transform is invertible. And um yeah so and that's that's how you uh invert it excuse me um yeah so here you can note notice that that feature that was i was talking about before that we're what we're really transforming to our functions on the on the fine group because like this measure in the integral is that is the left invariant group measure on the on the affine group um right yeah so that so that kind of gives you the idea how to generalize um so one way to go about it is like you could use the affine group in higher dimensions or what appears to be the case instead of the instead of the affine group people people use something called the similitude group um which is which is the group that um that preserves the inner product up to a multiplicative positive constant right so what does it mean well essentially translations preserve the inner product rotations preserve the inner product and if you do scaling well then scaling uh, preserves the inner product up to a multiplicative constant so so that's kind of how people do it um the cool thing is like um i've seen it in some in some paper about medical imaging like if you if you add in this like you're doing the wave of transform in 2d and of course you could you could do it as a as a sort of 
tensor product of um, one-dimensional transformations, like the same way you do uh, with Fourier transform. Um, but if you add, instead of doing that, like, you know, wave transform in each variable, if you do like this collective uh, wave transform and you add in this extra, um, you know, rotational, uh, degree of freedom, then you can do some cool um, uh, image analysis, like where you pick like uh, a wavelet that's not isotropic. So that means that when you rotate it, you're actually like changes the function. Um, it, it isn't just some like, you know, for example, Gaussian, right, which is isotropic. Um, and what they were able to do is like they they were doing images of eyes and like they were trying to enhance the the veins the, the small veins you have uh, or the small blood vessels you have in your eye and then if you if you allow this this uh, rotational degree of freedom then you can really you know adjust your wavelet function it kind of works like an like an aperture at that point. Um, and you can pick out those um, interesting features. Right. So this kind of brings us to the topic of that scale dependent quantum field theory. So, um, so we do, we just perform the wavelet transform um on our field and we and we get like we don't get like so before we kind of discretized the theory to a lattice um now we go from a continuous theory to a continuous theory um but it has some interesting features like already at this point, uh, some things are regularized. For example, the two point functions, right? Um, since this is essentially, so if you subscribe to that interpretation that quantum fields are operator valued distributions, then what the wavelet transform does is well, essentially it smears out um, the field and uh, well, that's my explanation at least for it. <laughs> and that makes uh, all these like two point functions um, convergent when you when you take the coincidence limit, um, which is not really the case uh, in in usual QFT, so already at this point there is there is something nice about about this description, and yes, of course we could we could also be more general, right? So here I'm doing I'm doing that uh, wave of transformation only in the positional variable, but of course in general we could have uh, we could have it act on time as well, and there isn't much literature about relativistic wavelets. Um, people haven't been really working on that much um but what it means also is that as i was talking before like so in two euclidean dimension you have like the angle of the rotation here if you have one plus one d you could additionally have um uh, a wave that changes with uh with the rapidity 
right? So that's, and that might be interesting for detecting some things. Um, we really haven't worked on that. So I have, I have no idea what, what it could be good for. Um, right, yeah. Feynman diagrams. Um, so you can, <laughs> You can spend an awful amount of time uh, rewriting uh, Feynman rules to account for this um, additional uh, degree of freedom of scale. Uh, here they have also the uh, what I call attitudes of the of the of the wavelet function, but it's not too important. Doesn't change much. Um, yeah, so you can you can modify the modify the, the Feynman rules uh, so that you know how to connect all of these pieces together, like you know this propagator with this interaction vertex, right? And how all of those labels connect together. Um, and well, once you do that, you 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 haven't actually done anything, right? So you you've just You've just done a, a whole bunch of rewriting, and um, you still have um, uh, you still have like diagrams that have divergences in them. Like so, you have your tadpole diagram and that loop integral with these, you know, modified Feynman rules is like you know you haven't changed anything. So that loop integral, but that, that that loop is still going to give you a divergence. Um, so that's where the kind of interesting idea comes in of, of wavelet regularization. And the, and the two people that kind of came up with this are uh, Mikhail uh, Altaiski and, and I forgot her first name, but uh, Kaputkina. Uh, Two, guys, two people from Russia, they had this idea of um, behind this wavelet regularization, which kind of states that um, when we have this tadpole diagram, we have, you, you, would, you could say like an incoming momentum at one scale and outgoing momentum at a different scale. And the assertion is that all the loop processes that are happening between those two points uh, should be happening at scales uh, that are larger than those two um, external scales. So that's, that's what they call the wavelet regularization. And then what it effectively boils down to is that like you have your loop. So if you didn't have this you know, function here that I'm going to get to, that would be your usual um, loop. In, in 1D it's, you know, that integral <laughs> uh, converges, but of course, you know, in, in higher dimensions, uh, while well, that is no longer convergent. Um, and that's where this guy F comes in. And what that is called is, uh, it's called a cutoff function. Um, I think I have a figure of it on the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, here we have like a, well, this is the wavelet function. It's just the first excitation of the harmonic oscillator. That's one of our favorite wavelets we like to use. Um, and well, here at the bottom, we have the cutoff function. And the reason behind the name of cutoff function is like you, you start at one. And then, and then you go to zero, right? And 
that's kind of so in in band limited uh, QFT, you have a you have like a step function as a cutter function, right? You, you you are you know it's one 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 and then suddenly it's zero. So here with those wavelets, you instead of working with these step functions, you uh, you have these smoothed out um, uh, cut of functions, right? Or if you want to think about it in a different way, it's like uh, right. You can sort of think of it as a as a filter, right? kind of filters out the uh, higher momentum physics, I guess. Um, right. So the color function and the wavelet function are sort of intimately related to each other. Um, you can you can write one in terms of the other. And also, the other interesting thing is that um, you can, so we arrived at those kind of functions from like Feynman diagram regularization, but you could also get to them by, you know, taking your field. Uh, now it's the scale dependent field in the wavelet picture, and then doing like the um, usual uh, you know plane wave expansion with uh, creation annihilation operators where the annihilation operators now have also um, a a scale variable um, so it's like a creation annihilation operators of momentum p at scale a for example and then you demand right so that's you demand that uh the creation operators at some at scales lower than some you know cutoff scale uh do not excite uh the vacuum state and that's sort of like you know in sort of similar to that statement in those in those loops where we were saying that well we don't really want um, uh, the loops to involve virtual particles that uh, that are appearing at a scale that is finer than the uh, than the two external scales. And so the way we showcase this is with us with a simple, I guess this, the, the kind of simplest <laughs> calculation you can do in QFT, which is the Casimir effect. Um, so you know in the Casimir effect you you want to uh, evaluate the energy density between so like you know quick reminder casimir effect is like you have two uh two boundaries like two conductive plates and then uh you want to find out what's the what's the energy density between those two plates um and then you find out that there is a that there is an energy difference between the energy inside and the energy outside, um, but it's a it's a really nice like you know simple um, calculation you can do, and um, so you're looking at this this vacuum energy density, and if you use that assertion that the modes uh, at at lower scales do not exist, basically. <laughs> Uh, here you you end up with the with the cutoff function again, and then you can like 
and then you can do um well you basically do the same derivation from that point as 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 Casimir did in his in his original paper and then you get the renormalized um energy density which is like the uh, energy density between the plates minus the uh, energy density of the field outside um and then uh so and for that you have a sort of expansion the first term is the is is the usual result and as it should be because like you know in a sense this is still like a regularization so if we remove it we should all agree uh on on the result right so removing here means sending capital a to zero um and then you have so so that's like your cut of independent um uh value and then then you have some corrections and the interesting thing was that this this whole part here this this correction really strongly depended on the on the cho on the choice of the wavelet right so you could by choosing a, a wavelet function you could basically like get wildly different behaviors um like even for example like then then you know if you convert it into the Casimir force then um that that the plate should be experiencing um we found some weird wavelets where you could where you where the direction of the force would be uh changing as you were like you know moving in the plates um right where the yeah the s is the separation of the plates um so that's uh that's weird and right the whole derivation like you can find here we've written a little bit about that um yeah right and i think this is this is like the <laughs> the most recent recent thing that we've been looking at and people who had a look at um the rqi circuit talk have heard about this um how am i doing for time Very good. Um, so I'm going to have to run off soon, actually. Um, All right. So, uh, well, that... I mean, I can, I can, I can stop here, and if we want to do like a discussion, well, well, others might, do a discussion. others can join, and we were still recording, so you're happy to keep going. I don't know if other people need to run off as well. Um, but uh, I, I I can just drop out and then Nick Nico can uh, take over. So that's fine. Okay. Okay, I'll I'll keep going then and kind of be quicker about it. So recently we've been looking at this holographic duality. Um because like you know, in the in the discrete description, um, we find kind of found this discrete bulk lattice, um, and it showed like evidence of of like a ADS CFT correspondence, because like the you know mutual information between those lattice sites is like following the expected behavior that it falls off exponentially with geodetic distance of the ADS uh, space time. And then 
there are some you know other observations like you know this like the famous view takayanaki formula from ADS CFT. Um, so we kind of wanted to arrive at that with with those continuously parameterized wavelets. Um, and to do that, we kind of wanted to use this idea that you can obtain a metric from the correlation functions of your of your uh, of your QFT. So um, the basic idea is that you have that 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 the correlation function uh, is essentially a function of distance, and then you can kind of invert that relationship to get the something called the Singe verb function, which is just the square, or like half the square of the geodetic distance between two points. And the trick is now that if you differentiate um, the, the world function, <laughs> sorry, with respect to its endpoints and then bring them together, you get the metric in general. So that way um you can you know given given your correlation function you can obtain from that uh, the metric of the of the underlying manifold right so so this is like a fairly well old idea at this point i guess it's really like you know popularized by Akim Kempf that instead of you know manifolds and metrics we actually don't need the metric we just it's sufficient to talk about manifolds and propagators um yeah so that's well we have a so in 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 the scale dependent QFT we have a correlation function it is parameterized by time position and a variable and well what if what what would happen if we interpreted the scale as an additional coordinate so instead of a two-dimensional manifold we now have a three-dimensional model and we could compute you know just you know, just try to use the formula and see what we get basically um Right, this, yeah, so this is just a remark that some, you know, when you do those calculations, you can like really simplify some of those things if, you, if you're using the symmetries of, of, the, of the field. And then these symmetry arguments can kind of lead you to this um, sort of, uh, observation that like if you if you differentiate the, the wavelet correlation function raised to some power and then take the coincidence limit you you get something that's proportional to the scale variable to raise to some power right um here the delta is the is the scaling dimension of the field um and then like it's like the, the the power of the scale variable and then some uh numbers and from that you know and not only that it's it's like calculation is more involved but you know basically it's what it boils down to so you calculate your metric for a bosonic theory, uh, and you get you get something, you get some metric, you know, and then you know with a the fermionic theory you have to use a slightly different formula, but you, know, you, you can you can still get something similar, like you, you can still infer metric from a fermionic propagator, um, and then from that you get you get a different kind of metric. 
right? So, so the, for the for the fermions, you you get the ADS metric from the from the uh, propagator, but for bosons, you do you, you don't, right? Uh, and so at least one of those interesting observations is so i was talking about how the casimir effect strongly depended on the choice of the wavelet function um here like we do have some dependence on the on the choice of the wavelet function but uh those ends up those end up being just some constants um and sure like you're get you're getting like you know space times with slightly different uh uh scalar curvatures or something uh but it it doesn't like doesn't change the type of geometry at least right so it's it's not as disruptive, I guess, as, as it was in the Casimir effect. Um, um, so, so the observation was that, well, there is something weird going on, right? Our, our bosons and fermions based on the correlation functions can't agree on the geometry of this the scale bulk um so the question well, the question is still is is that is that a feature or a bug um and our hypothesis is that it is a bug um and maybe we should be instead of looking at correlation functions we should be looking at um some more robust measure like mutual information right um and you know there are we're having some issues with that because like whenever you are trying to use these entropic quantities in QFT, it's kind of hard. Um, and you you have to use a lot of sophisticated machinery, um, mainly, I think, algebraic QFT. Um, and also the other kind of point that we run into, and we haven't seen anyone else do it, is that if you have a lattice theory, you there is a there is a well-defined notion of mutual information between two lattice sites. But the question is, does does that generalize to the continuum limit? Can you have mutual information between two spacetime points? Um, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, and we've been doing some like you know rough naive you know calculations um and so for a moment we kind of have an idea how to map out like time slices <laughs> for massless bosons um and so that kind of gives us hope that you know, at least in terms of mutual information, we will get an agreement on the type of geometry because at least in those time slices, those time slices, according to that mutual information, look like um, ADS. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think that's um, that's that's all I have prepared for today. Um, and I'm gonna leave this up if you if you wanna have some reading. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Mute.